Kia ora koutou, ko Douglas Walker, toko ingoa. Um, we're here this afternoon for the Level 3 Biology Human Evolution um, session with the wonderful Emma Campbell. Uh, Emma Campbell is um, currently with uh, Wellington Girls College, um, and Emma's going to lead us through um, this standard. So if you've got any questions during the presentation, you can pop them in chat and I'll either interrupt Emma and ask them or I'll hold them back until an opportune time at the end. Uh, massive thank you, obviously, to Emma and also to Studia who are um, assisting with the presentation of these webinars. All right. Thank you very much, Emma. Over to you. Fantastic. Uh, kia ora everyone. As uh, Doug introduced, I'm Emma Campbell and I'm going to take you through uh, trends in human evolution today, so bio 3.6. Now, one thing I really want to reiterate with this topic is it's called trends in human evolution. So we're looking at how our ancestors have changed over time. I think a lot of people get quite um, caught up in memorising specific detail about different ancestors, but it's much more about kind of bigger picture thinking and how things have changed from five, six million years ago through to today. So it's full credits. It's a really interesting internal and it, uh, external, sorry, and it's um, always super fun to, to teach and to learn about. So we'll dive straight into it. So as with my other topics, if you've been to the other bio webinars, I like to visualise a topic. And you can break this topic up into three key areas. The first is looking at the biological evolution of our ancestors. So it might be looking at our, our bodies compared to our closest living relatives, the chimpanzee, or to a specific ancestor looking at how it's changed over time. So that you could be looking specifically at changes in the skull or changes in the skeleton or changes within the skull, so the endocranial, endo meaning inside and cranial being the skull. So also known as how the brain has developed. Okay. When you are talking about these biological changes, you're often asked to relate it either to bipedalism, so the fact that Homo sapien today walks on two legs uh, compared to some of our ancestors or our closest living relatives, or you might be asked to link it to change in diet, sometimes even both. So you do want to be familiar with biological features that are associated with being bipedal and with having a more meat-based diet as opposed to a plant-based diet. The second area that we want to look at is the cultural evolution. So it's not just about how a physiology has changed, but actually also about how our understanding of the world around us has changed as well and how that has influenced behaviour. So as we look at our ancestors, you want to be familiar with the different tool cultures, so the older one, the Acheulean, Mysterian and Upper Paleolithic tool cultures. When it comes to the, those tools, you want to know who used some kind of key features around them and how they were made and what they were used for. So were they used to scavenge, to hunt, to farm, that type of thing. You want to be familiar with fire. What did fire bring to the table, I guess? So who used or who was able to control fire? Um, often people talk about inventing fire, but fire is a natural phenomenon. It has been around <laughs> longer than we have. So it's not about inventing fire, it's about controlling fire. Okay, what benefits did the ability to control fire bring to our ancestors? And also food gathering, how, did, how has that changed over time? Language and abstract thought, at what point did our ancestors begin to communicate with one another, the brain development, for example. When did we start to see um, thoughts and ideas associated with art or an afterlife, that type of thing. Finally, we've got the dispersal of humans. So looking at our ancestors, we start off in Africa 
at what point did our earliest ancestors leave Africa? At what point did Homo sapiens leave Africa? And once they left Africa, what path did they take? And why did they take a particular pathway? Why did they reach this area before they reached their other area? Okay. But most importantly, you want to be familiar with how these ideas all interlink with one another. So we talk quite a lot about a positive feedback system, kind of like a snowball effect, how changes in biology could lead to changes in culture, which can then further increase brain development, that type of thing. So these different topics are not in isolation of one another. It's really important to understand that changes in one can lead to a change in the other and then a positive feedback, a snowballing effect where these changes gather momentum and we start to see some pretty drastic changes in our ancestors. Cool. So we've talked um, about how this topic is much more about ge general changes over time, but there are some ancestors that you want to be familiar with. You want to know roughly where they were found and when and what features. So we'll start off with looking about, talking about Ardipithecus remitus, or Ardi, it's often referred to. So Ardi is um, a really early fossil uh, ancestor that we found fossils for that have um, showed both bipedal features, but still features associated with arboreal living, so living um, in trees and climbing. Okay. Then we move on to Australopithecus afarensis, or also known as Lucy. So there's a particular um, fossil or specimen that has been found which has been named Lucy. Um, and they have, although still very ape-like um, features in the face, their skeleton is quite um, quite well suited to bipedalism. And I'll show you that a little bit later on. Paranthropus boisei. So this is sometimes referred to as nutcracker men. They were these specialist uh, herbivores that were had these huge zygomatic arches, so that gives that really wide face. Um, that is associated with chewing roots and breaking down um, nuts and seeds and things like that. So these guys were specialist herbivores. The Paranthropus uh, genus is kind of a branch off our um, family tree, so not thought to be one of our direct ancestors, but a, a cousin, I guess. So we go into our earliest members of the genus that we are part of, which is Homo habilis. So some of the features associated with habilis is the fact that it's thought that they were the earliest um, ancestors to regularly use tools. We associate them with the older one tool culture. Okay, and they were able to use them to scavenge um, already kind of processed carcasses. So they would wait till a predator killed some prey, had worked over the carcass, and then were able to go and use their tools and extract the bone marrow, which was really uh, nutrient rich. And so it's at this point we start to see some pretty drastic brain development because of this newfound energy source. Moving on, we start to see um, our first ancestors that's, that look actually really quite human-like, so that loss of that full body hair. Um, we've got Homo erectus and Homo agaster. They're often associated together because they are very similar. Agaster was found in Africa. Erectus found outside of Africa. But you will sometimes see Homo agaster referred to as African Homo erectus. This has since been kind of rephrased and they've been identified as their own separate species, um, but they were very similar. And these guys were endurance hunters. They covered vast distances um, looking for food and things like that. Moving back into Africa, uh, we've got Homo heidelbergensis, was also found in Europe as well um, and is thought to have been then an uh, ancestor of Homo sapien. Then the Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis, found in Europe. These guys were um, 
in Europe during the Ice Age. So they are really, really efficient hunters. They were they were taking down woolly mammoths essentially, and they're built for really cold environments as well. And finally, Homo sapiens. So this is the group that we are part of. So you will talk about that a little bit later on as well. Cool. So as with a lot of the um, ideas in this topic, I think a really good way to revise for uh, externals is to look at past exam questions to familiarise yourself with um, not only the content but also who, what are they asking when they phrase something this way, what do they specifically want to know. You start to get some ideas around how to formulate an answer and use evidence that they give you. So I thought I would weave the content into looking specifically at last year's exam. It does mean that I won't necessarily cover the entire topic, but if you go back to have a look at the webinar from last year, um, there's bound to, I'm bound to cover something that I don't in this topic, in this one. So the first question, generally speaking, there's is a question on biological evolution, cultural evolution, and dispersal. Not always one on dispersal, um, but there, there does tend to follow a pattern. Now, with a um, biology exam, if you've been to my earlier ones, earlier um, sessions, you'll know that they cover a similar format and that describing is asking you to talk about what something is. When it asks you to explain, it wants you to either talk about how we, something happens or why something happens. And then when you ask to discuss, your excellence is often around linking different ideas together, linking it to the context of the question, or perhaps linking um, ideas. So maybe you're comparing or contrasting, or maybe you're saying this happens, which will lead to this, which will lead to this. So kind of bringing in different ideas together. So the first question last year was about bipedalism and how it came about and the changes that happened as a result of that. So it's hard to picture now, but if you think about Africa 25 million years ago, it was covered in rainforest. Okay, so really dense forests with trees, these everywhere, and our ancestors were able to swing through the trees really easily. Okay, so brachiating. That's what we, the term we give to swinging from branch to branch. However, climate change occurred. Uh, so with the, um, with the change in the climate, Africa became hotter and drier. And then as a result over that time, the, the forest died back and was replaced with grass. So a lush rainforest has now moved into a much more open grassland environment. Okay. So our ancestors that were able to swing from tree to tree were no longer able to do that because the, the distances between the trees became much larger. So they had to get down from the tree and walk along the ground. Now, doing that on two legs is much more energy efficient. So it doesn't always feel like it, but humans are really well built for walking long distances, okay? So walking two legs on two legs is much more energy efficient than walking on four. So getting down from the trees and walking along the ground. Now that swinging between the trees was no longer an option to get around. So what changes had to occur because of that? So think about they asked for a change in the skull and also the spine that allowed for successful bipedal, so walking on two legs, locomotion. So I've put just a summary of some of the different um, features that you could talk about. So we've got the nuchal crest. Now, if you put your hand to the back of your skull, 
you would see you'll feel that it's quite round back there. Now, if you were quadrupedal, like say a chimpanzee, you would have quite a prominent ridge line back there. What that does is it's where your neck muscles would attach to hold your head upright. Now, our head is our skull is held upright through balancing on the spine. So we no longer need those really strong neck muscles to hold our head into place. Okay, Through balancing, it means that we don't have to have muscles engaged all the time, and so it's actually more energy efficient. It also means that our skull has been able to round out and create a larger cranial capacity for our brain. So that's one of the changes that has occurred. The foramen magnum is another one that has occurred. So foramen magnum literally translates to large hole. So the big hole in the skull where the spine uh, attaches um, into the skull and to the brain. Now, in a quadruped like a chimpanzee or in their quadrupedal ancestors, they that hole is at the back of the skull, okay? Because the spine enters the back of the skull and attaches to the brain then, okay? In humans, remember, our skull relies on balance, and so it has moved from the back to directly under. Again, it means that we don't need neck muscles to hold our head into place, and it's much more energy efficient, okay? So we no longer need to actively hold our head up. It just balances there. Another change would be the prognathic angle. So in it, the diagram of the chimpanzee that I've got right here, you can see that the chimpanzee has a snout, that a big part of the skull's mass is in front of the skull. Okay, whereas in a homo sapien it is vertical. So a vertical face means that once again we've got a skull balancing on the spinal cord or the spinal column and we don't need to actively hold it in place. Okay, so they are some of the changes to the skull that is associated with bipedalism. There's lots of changes as well associated with diet but we want to stick to what the question is asking us. So finally, there's also the change in the spine. Now, you'll notice that if you round your hand down your spine, it has an S shape. So it does a curve out and then curves back in at the base of your back. Okay. So that S shape acts as a shock absorber when a bipedal individual walks. It's Quadrupedal, like a quadrupedal ancestors or a chimpanzee today, it's much more C shape because the spine isn't acting as a shock absorber. It doesn't take on the um, shock of every step like it does in a biped. So, because it's an explained question, you want to say what the change is and why we have seen that change. Okay. Then the question goes on to say, using an australopithecine species, so not talking about homo sapiens, not talking about a chimpanzee, but an, one of our early ancestors that was known to be bipedal, what are two bipedal features of the leg, including the foot, uh, to the success and the survival of that species? So a really good example of talking about australopithecine is to talk about Australopithecus afarensis. So this is our Lucy skeleton that I alluded to before. So a 60% complete skeleton um, of this fossil was found. Of this species, it's been named Lucy. And um, from this specimen, we've been able to learn a lot about this species. You might also talk about Australopithecus africanus. Africanus and afarensis are very closely related and so are very similar in their skeletal um, makeup. So if you have a look at the skeleton, you can see that actually the, the pelvis, legs, we well, can't see the feet, 
there, but they are very similar to human. So looking at this, we can make the um, conclusion that uh, Lucy or Afarensis was a biped, okay? Although still has really um, ape-like features in the skull, has some really um, similar features to what modern humans have today. So one, there's a few different things that you could talk about. One would be the vulgus angle. So if you have a look at the femur here, you will see that from the pelvis to the knee, the femur is angled. We call that the vulgus angle. Now, in something like a chimpanzee, the femur goes directly down. So the knees are the same width as the hip. Whereas if you stand um, on the floor, you'll notice that and put your knees together, you'll notice that there's an angle that your femur takes there. What that allows you to do is you can stand on one foot and still maintain your balance. So when you're walking, you stand on one foot while the other one swings forward and you're still balanced. You don't have to sway from side to side to try and counterbalance it. A chimpanzee, for example, if they stand on one foot, they have to counterbalance and sway way from side to side as they walk. What that does is called the swagger and it ta actually takes a lot of energy because they're having to do this extra movement in order to walk. Humans and Australopithecus didn't have to do that so that is another way that bipedal walking saves a lot of energy. Also the fact that the legs are longer than the arms so in a ancestors that were um, brachiating through the trees, it was an advantage to have long arms because you'd have a further field of reach. In bipedal, you move around by striding out your leg, so it means that it's an advantage to have a longer leg to cover a larger stride during that. Another example would be moving to look at the foot. So if you hold your hand up, you'll see that your thumb is at a different angle to the rest of your fingers. In some of our ancestors and in our, um, our relatives that are currently alive but live in trees like chimpanzees, you'll see that their big toe is very similar. So they can grip with their feet. That's a real advantage if you are needing to um, clasp, grasp onto branches using your feet. But actually, it doesn't offer anything when you're walking along the ground on two legs. Instead, what has happened is our big toe has moved up and forward into line with the rest of our feet. So if you have a look at your feet, your big toe should be in line with the rest of your toes. What that does is when you walk, you toe off, which means the last part of your foot to touch the ground is the big toe. It thrusts the foot forward. And it means that you can walk using less energy because you've got that, that towing off, that forward thrust of the big, from the big toe. And also your foot acts as a shop absorber because it has an arch in it as well. So once again, really well suited for long distance walking across the ground. All of these together, the changes in the skull, the changes and the spine and the leg and the foot means that we can cover long distances really efficiently. Okay, so it use a lot less energy than some of our uh, quadrupedal ancestors or quadrupedal relatives. Okay, it also means that we can carry food, we can carry young, we can free the hands to start to pick things up, manipulate things. We start to see the tool culture associated with that. So it offered a survival advantage because it was energy efficient. They could, uh, and Australopithecus could see further across the grasslands. They could see predators. They could see prey. They could look after their young by carrying them, that type of thing. We've got a couple of questions, Emma. Is that all right? Yeah. 
Um, is the pelvis involved when uh, students ask to describe or discuss leg features? Um, I wouldn't talk if they ask specifically to talk about leg features. I wouldn't talk about the pelvis per se. But having said that, the pelvis is also really important because the change in the shape of the pelvis um, acts as support for our internal organs. So it has its own individual role to play in um, supporting bipedalism. It just so happens that this question didn't necessarily ask about it. Cool. Thank you. And um, can we go through the changes to the collarbone, scapula, shoulder joint and arm to leg ratio and what advantages they provided? Now, you might you might already be coming to that. Uh, yeah, we can we can um, run through that. So in a chimpanzee, unfortunately, I don't have any diagrams that show that really what easily. But in a chimpanzee, the scapula or the shoulder blade is to the side because the arms socket is much more to the side, which means a change in the um, clavicle and the collarbone to allow for the arms to be downward on the ground for the knuckle walking. So if you were to press your hands on the ground, you would kind of start to get an idea of how we might it might be more comfortable for them. Also, they need to have a um, shoulder um, much more, I guess, um, stronger shoulder and much more really good movement through the shoulder to allow them to swing. So the shoulder blade is to the side. The clavicle is much more at an angle where it's quite flat in humans, so that collarbone. And in chimpanzees, for example, will have a much longer arm because they are advantageous when you are swinging through the trees as opposed to just walking along the ground. Our arms are really good at carrying things, particularly our hands, but they're not actually that good at swing, helping us swing anymore. So we, we've lost a lot of strength and mobility in that, based on that. I hope that answers your question. I think so. Thank you, Emma. No worries. So that was just a really brief run through of biological evolution. You want to also be familiar with changes associated with the diet as well. So that is talking about um, sagittal crest, the zygomatic arches, the change in the mandible or jaw shape, um, among other things. But um, just for the, the sake of time, we'll, we'll keep going. So moving into cultural evolution. So looking at our cultural evolution question from last year. Now, this was an interesting question in that it was about a specific species. They're not always going to be focusing on a specific species. Often it's about how culture has changed over time across species. We might be looking at tool cultures or um, a number of different um, food gathering or um, art. I think some have come up in the past. But last year it was about a specific species and how their cultural evolution or cultural features, behaviours, allowed them to be successful. So I mentioned earlier you want to be familiar with the two tool cultures. You want to know who used them, what are some of the key features, and how it was used. Now, in this question, it asks, name and describe the predominant tool culture associated with Homo erectus. So that is looking at the Aculean tool culture. So to name it, you just say what it is, Aculean, and describe some of the features. So you might talk about how it was a um, the teardrop hand axe that is really um, commonly associated with this tool culture. It's made from uh, approximately 50-ish blows, more than older one, less than um, Mysterian. So not as refined as other tool cultures um, that came after it, like Mysterian and Upper Paleolithic, but has a little bit more than older one. And it allowed them to hunt. So Agasta and Erectus were our first hunters. They weren't as proficient hunters as 
like the Neanderthals, for example, they were what we would call endurance hunters. So they would follow their prey for really long periods, really long distances, until essentially their prey collapsed. At that point, once they were weak enough, they would go in and they would kill the prey or process the carcass. So they weren't scavengers like Habilis was, but they weren't able to take down large prey like um, the Neanderthals using the Mysterian tool culture. So they would use it to cut meat, dig up roots, that type of thing. Um, they weren't, a, they didn't at this point have them on a spear or anything like that. That comes later. It's literally just a shaped stone that's shaped like a teardrop and has a sharpened edge to, to process meat. However, it was really important um, for them and it did lead to a, a new way of life. So Aculean allowed for endurance hunting, as I said later, which went, took our ancestors from being scavengers, just trying to get what they um, could find, to actively kind of getting a diet that had more energy, more protein, much more nutrient-rich. Erectus is also associated with the ability to control fire. So they start to cook their food for the first time. That makes it a lot easier to digest, to break down those proteins, because um, the proteins had already denatured, link back to level two cells there. Um, it killed pathogens, it killed bacteria. So they were getting a lot more from their food. So the tool and the fire meant that they suddenly had a much more protein-rich diet, much more energy from their food. They were able to get more from it which was able to then fuel um, some biological changes. Also, the fire meant they could move into colder areas. Erectus, they found um, fossils of Homo erectus up in Europe. They've also found them through Asia. So they were able to move into cold, cooler areas using fire. They could extend their activity into nighttime. Um, we start to see like real social bonds forming as um, individuals start to sit around the fire and it also coincides with the beginning of language. Um, and so we can, there was a lot more social time, social bonding, learning from one another is really important. So I mentioned earlier about how this is all a positive feedback loop. So you can see this really well when you think about how the use of fire, having the better tools, the Aculean tools, the starting to form social bonds, starting to communicate, cooperative hunting, leads to a much better diet, a higher quality diet, more protein, more fat, which then fuels brain development. That larger brain then leads to better tools, better cooperation, better communication. So we start to see how it can be a real feedback, positive feedback loop. What starts with slight um, minor changes, leads to a change in diet, leads to brain development, further changes, etc. All in all, this means that our ancestors or Homo erectus was able to move into new areas and change their behaviours to utilise the new resources that they may have found once moving out of Africa and into Europe and through Asia. So you can kind of see that really nice link between biological evolution and cultural evolution and how they feed together in really nicely and also at least to dispersal because without biological changes, we wouldn't have had cultural changes and vice versa. And without that brain development, without that culture in place, they wouldn't have been able to leave Africa. So talking about leaving Africa, I've got a couple of um, questions that allow us to just kind of chat about the migration of Homo sapiens outside of Africa. So we know that... Homo erectus was found outside of Africa. 
Okay. We know that um, Homo agaster was found in Africa, and it's thought that Homo sapiens evolved from agaster, from Heidelbergensis, inside Africa, and then left as Homo sapiens. So there's been a number of migrations out of Africa over the years. It's thought that Homo sapiens probably evolved about 200,000 years ago, approximately, inside Africa. And then a first wave of Homo sapiens left Africa about 100,000 years ago. It's thought that they probably died out. And then a second wave left. Um, it's some estimates as close back as about 60,000 years ago. So we'll have a chat about this question. So this question asks you to talk about the different theories around dispersal. So there's two theories around where Homo sapiens developed or evolved. The first is called out of Africa. The second is called the multi-regional theory. Now you want to say, be able to describe both theories and the evidence that supports them or doesn't support them. Okay. So the first question, uh, first bullet point of the question was describe a hominin species that evolved outside of Africa. And you could actually talk about a few different ones here. You could talk about Homo erectus, um, thought to have been um, a gaster in Africa, and then Homo erectus outside of Africa. Or there's Homo floresiensis uh, found um, in Indonesia. The Neanderthals which are thought to have evolved outside of Africa from Heidelbergensis in Europe, and then the Denisovans. You may or may not be familiar with the Denisovans. It's pretty fascinating, but we don't know a huge amount about this group of individuals called the Denisovans, but I'll talk about them a little bit later on. So explain the out-of-Africa theory and how it differs from the multi-regional theory. This looks like a lot, but I'm a very visual person, so I thought i will show it to you visually. So the multi-regional theory states that Homo gaster left Africa 1.8 million years ago and became Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus was found in Europe and Asia. We know that. We found fossils for Homo erectus in Europe and Asia. But in these areas, Africa, Asia, and Europe, Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens. Okay, so that would say that Homo sapiens alive today last shared a single ancestor 1.8 million years ago. That's the multi regional theory. And to be honest, there is very, very little that supports that theory. Some um, Fossils, people have found, uh, thought to have shown transitional um, features, so maybe some Homo sapien features, but also features associated with earlier ancestors. But to be honest, that's about it. None of the DNA evidence supports multi regional theory. And so if you are asked to talk about it, you're most likely going to be asked to talk about how. It in comparison to the out of Africa, there is a lot more well supported. So the out of Africa theory is the one that is shown on the right-hand side of the screen. That tells us that Homo gaster was left Africa 1.8 million years ago and evolved into Homo erectus in Europe and Asia. And then they both died out. Okay. However, Homo agaster evolved into Heidelbergensis, which led to Homo sapiens. So Homo sapiens evolved only in Africa, and then they spread out. It's sometimes called the replacement theory because Homo sapien replaced Erectus in Europe and in Asia. Okay, So the DNA supports this. Fossil supporter artifacts associated with um, Homo sapiens, so like tool cultures and pottery and art, all support this out of Africa 
Okay. So then comment on both physical and behavioural, so aka biological evolution and cultural evolution that enabled the success of Homo sapiens as they migrated out of Africa into Europe and the Pacific. So what were the biological features that they had to have in order to survive? Well, Homo sapiens survived because they had really big brains. Okay, They were able to communicate really well with one another. They were able to communicate with other hominins that they met, so the Neanderthals, the Denisovans. Um, they were had, because of their large brain, they had the ability to, um, I guess, forward plan. So we start to see things like trade networks developing between uh, groups of Homo sapiens. They had tool cultures that allowed them to hunt, but also to fish, to sew. They could sew clothing, that type of thing. So their brains really allowed them to survive outside of Africa. And their cultural features, the fact that they were able to harness fire, helped. Um, they were able to work together cooperatively, hunt together as a group, um, also trade with one another. They were able to you, um, develop clothing, which was important as they moved north into cold Europe. They could sew clothing um, and also shelter as well. They could build shelters to protect themselves from the elements. They could hunt. They could fish. A lot of their migration pathways follow coastlines because it was a really good way of gathering food. So it's both the biological and the cultural features that allow for uh, dispersal into our outside of Africa. So one thing that does come up is migration pathways. So I just thought I would touch on that, even though it wasn't necessarily in last year's exam, but I think it is worth um, going over and talking about who they, who our ancestors meet. So Homo sapiens thought to have evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago. Cool. So this is where we are here. Now, a early group um, was thought to have um, left Africa around 90,000 years ago. They found some fossils in the Middle East around there, but it's thought that they died out. Um, then a second wave left Africa, a second group, and we're only talking about a small group here. We're not talking about a huge population. We may be 200-odd individuals. So a really small population left Africa and moved out into the Middle East where they met the Neanderthal, Neanderthals really quite early on. And some inbreeding occurred between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. So that is why everybody alive today who is not of uh, sub-Saharan ancestry or African ancestry can find some Neanderthal DNA in their genome between 1% to 4%. Now, Homo sapiens followed along the coastlines really quickly and moved and arrived into through the Pacific, through Melanesia, and arrived to Australia as recently as about 50 to 40,000 years ago. So really quickly they were able to move along here. You've got to remember this is during a time of the Ice Age, so a lot of the seawater was locked up, in, or a lot of water, sorry, was locked up in glaciers, really large glaciers, so sea levels were much lower. So they could, there were land bridges that no longer exist today. They could cross certain um, areas that you can't cross today. It was only later on, once the temperature started to increase, that Homo sapiens were able to move up into Europe or move up into northern areas of Asia and then into, say, the Americas, for example. So they were, um, I guess, colonised by Homo sapiens much later on, 
because of that cold climate. So what I thought I'd do is I pulled this question up from the, I think it was the 2016 exam, because it asked about particular migration routes and who they met along the way. So we know that uh, Homo sapiens met Neanderthals really quick early on. There's also a group of Homo sapiens that met a group of individuals called the Denisovans. Now, we don't know a lot about the Denisovans. I think we found the tip of a pinky bone and we found a tooth in the Denisova cave in what is now modern Siberia. But we have been able to extract some DNA from that and we have been able to compare the Denisovan DNA to Neanderthal and to modern humans. We know that Denisovans and Neanderthals were separate groups but they were quite closely related to one another. So looking at reading through this um, information here, it talks about how scientists were able to analyse DNA from 1,500 people around the world, and they found a lot about um, admixture, they called it, but it's breeding between the different species. So today, a People that were born outside of sub-Saharan Africa carry between 1% to 4% Neanderthal DNA. Okay. People, some groups of um, people today also have uh, Denisovan DNA. So the people of Tibet, for example, have a gene um, called the EPAS1 gene that is also found in the Denisovan. Okay. And also... Um, people that have Neanderthal DNA have a gene called the HLA gene, which is associated with the Neanderthals. And we'll talk about what they do in a moment. So looking at this question, what it asks you to talk about, well, why did they leave Africa? Once they left Africa, why did they take the pathways that they did? And then what evidence supports that and bringing in that discussion around the genes that they got, that modern human got from Neanderthals and from the Denisovans. So if we go back to, well, why, why did Homo sapiens 60,000 years ago leave Africa? And Africa 60,000 years ago was really hot, it was really dry, resources were becoming quite scarce, and the human population was growing. So we know that um, competition, intraspecific competition, is a really um, powerful motivator to move into new areas. So it's thought that dispersal is associated with allowing homo, those, that group of Homo sapiens to access new resources. Okay. So how did the environment influence migration routes? And that's what I was talking about before. It was the fact that once our ancestors left Africa, they followed coastlines um, and moved into Southeast Asia and the Pacific really quickly. There were land bridges that um, don't no longer exist today, so they had pathways that uh, we could not follow right now. But if you have a look at those dates, left Africa 65,000 years ago and arrived in Australia 45,000 years. So that's pretty quick um, if you think about it in terms of migration and spread of individuals. It was only much later that they were able to move into Europe. So, for example, uh, 40,000 years and into Europe and 16,000 years um, up into like what would be North America because of the climate, because there were massive glaciers and really cold environments. So they you had to, I guess, wait until that climate uh, changed, which allowed that spread north into Europe and into the Americas. So you want to be familiar with uh, the DNA and the mitochondrial DNA that supports the out-of-Africa model. 
So DNA evidence that supports out of Africa is the fact that, that African populations have a far greater diversity within their population than non-African populations. So people of Asian, European, uh, Polynesian descent uh, have a lot less genetic diversity within their populations than uh, African populations do. And that's because African populations are much older and they've had a greater amount of time for variation to build up. Also, people whose ancestors were born outside of Africa carry that, that Neanderthal DNA, which tells us that um, our ancestors left Africa, got interbred with the Neanderthals, whereas people that can link their ancestry back to that sub-Saharan Africa group don't have that DNA because their ancestors never met the Neanderthals. They never came across them. There's also the mitochondrial DNA. So that is the idea that everybody alive today, no matter their ancestry group, can trace their mitochondrial DNA back to a single female living in Africa approximately 200,000 years ago. So this is really recent. Um, if it, the multi-regional theory was correct, this date would be 1.8 million years ago. But it's only 200,000 years ago. So in the grand scheme of evolution, is super recent. So every human alive today he shared an ancestor really recently. So actually there's not a lot of genetic variation within the human population. Finally, the last part of this question is discuss how admixture or breeding with the Denisovans or the Neanderthals helped with the dispersal. So I mentioned Homo sapiens bred with Neanderthals, and as a result, their offspring got the HLA gene. So the HLA gene is still found in the human genome today, and it's associated with the immune system. It's thought that it was this gene this protein from this gene, sorry, that um, gave the immune system the ability to survive when they left Africa and came across new pathogens. So there would have been a whole lot of new, new diseases, new bacteria, new viruses um, that our ancestors would have met once they left Africa, but because they had this HLA gene or protein um, in their white blood cells, allowed them to survive these new pathogens where they may not otherwise have been able to. There's also the EPAS1 gene, which is found in um, people who can link their ancestry back to Tibet. And it's thought that this was shared with the Denisovans, so our ancestors got it from the Denisovans, and it allowed the people... Um, the Tibetan people to live at really high altitudes. Um, it helps to bring in um, the absorption of oxygen and survive at much lower concentrations of oxygen. Um, so where our ancestors may not have been able to survive in that environment because they met the Denisovans, because they um, bred with the Denisovans and gained that EPAS1 gene, they were able to. Oh, so sorry, that was a real whirlwind through it all. Um, but hopefully that helps with um, some of your ideas around migration and dispersal patterns. Lovely. Thank you so much, Emma. We've got some great questions. There's been some good discussion in the chat. Uh, yeah. See if we can go through some of those. And then there was at the beginning a question relating back to the plants and animals topic. Um, yeah. I'll ask if we've got time. Um, mm -hmm. So um, probably one of, the, one of the most interesting ones was the... Um, Students noticed that you had ergaster um, coming out of Africa and then developing into a rectus. And mm -hmm. the question was, because I think some, some teachers might have taught this a little bit differently, how okay. specific do you need to be with ergaster coming out of Africa versus erectus coming out of Africa? I mean, a lot of textbooks describe ergaster as homo erectus. Um, so I don't think they will be too penalizing, I would take the lead from the question. So if they talk about erectus um, coming out of Africa, then 
then by all means use what they they give you. Um, the current theory is that ergasta is found in Africa and erect is found outside of Africa. So based on that, you would theorise that they left as ergaster and became erectus. Um, but it, as with a lot of things in this topic, there's so many unknowns and so many gaps that haven't been filled in. Um, so they can't they can't penalise you too harshly for it. But just um, take the lead from the question. So if they're asking you specifically about ergaster, talk about ergaster. If they're asking you about erectus, talk about erectus. But just know that erectus was the considered to be the first hominin outside of Africa. Lovely. Thank you. I'm a very detailed answer. And it, um, some of the points you made there harken back to the chat. And one of the students have said that it's pretty cool to have an exam that's evolving with the new evidence being discovered. And you've touched on that really nicely. Um, one more question about the um, cultural significance um, mm -hmm. in terms of perhaps domestication of plants and animals. Um, is that mm -hmm. also an important part of cultural evolution? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just go back to my um, my uh, diagram of this whole topic. So domestication of plants and animals is actually pretty recent, I think about 10 to 15,000 years ago. So we associate it with Homo sapiens and it is the, one of the food gathering techniques um, that comes in for that. So when we talk about food gathering, we're talking about how habilis scavenged. We talk about how agaster and erectus um, endurance hunted, how the Neanderthals were specialist hunters. And Homo sapiens, they hunted, they fished, but they also were able to farm as well. So it comes in under that food gathering umbrella. And it was a really important um, feature because it brought about um, an end to that nomadic lifestyle. So it completely changed the way that Homo sapiens lived and also interacted with, with one another. It allowed for job specialisation, for trade. Like we don't live near the coast, so we don't get a lot of fish, but we grow really good wheat here. So we'll swap and we start to see bartering and communication associated with that. But it also came with its downsides along with high density living, um, spread of disease, the the fact that our ancestors were reliant on weather um, and plague. So if something wiped out your crop, then you were in trouble and things like that. So it was a real turning point. I quite liked, I think it was an Anthropocene reviewed by uh, John Green. He talked about how um, grass cultivated humans rather than the, the way that we often view it. And I quite like that perspective. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> We've got one about spirituality in terms similar similar question. Spirituality, how important is that in terms of um, cultural evolution? Yeah, again, as was pretty important. So I've associated that with that kind of idea of abstract thought. So um, we start to see some sort of spiritual spirituality beginning with ne Neanderthals. A lot of air specimens around the Neanderthals um, have been, it looks like they've been, um, the fossils have been laid out as if the dead was laid out in a very specific way and animal bones and plant fossils around them. So, so it looks like some sort of burial um, and burial, um, I guess, coincides with an afterlife, the ideas around an afterlife. We also know that spirituality developed as the brain developed um, with art, um, with the sharing of stories once language developed and that type of thing. So, again, it, it was really important. It was a good way to share ideas and understanding of the world around them. So if you take, for example, some of their earlier ancestors, they don't have – it's thought that they didn't have the ability to, um, for example, see a footprint and understand that an animal has gone by here. They are very much in what's in front of them at the present, um, whereas that changed as their brains changed. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you might be able to clear up this one for us. Um, where did Neanderthals originate from? 
So Neanderthals are thought to have lived, a lot of their fossils for Neanderthals are found in Europe through France, Germany, Spain. Um, from that, we've also been able, we've looked at how how early we would have had to have met the Neanderthals to come across them as quickly as we did um, in order for Neanderthal DNA to spread um, through human populations as it has. So it's thought that they potentially lived also in the Middle East as well, although we haven't found, we usually associate their fossils with Europe. But the um, fact that we met them so quickly, we probably lived outside of there as well. Thank you. Um, how well do students need to remember the years of the various events? Not massively, not hugely well. I think a general timeline is much more important. So, for example, understanding um, that bipedalism came really early and after that we have seen like older one tool cultures associated with scavenging. So much more of a this happened, then leads to this. It's supposed opposed to really specific dates. You don't really need to know. Brilliant. Thank you. And I think we might just have time to squeeze in the plants question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. <laughs> yeah. um, when talking about clino slash orthokinesis, would yeah. it be positive slash negative clinokinesis or just clinokinesis? Just clinokinesis. So um, kinesis is a non-directional response. It's a change in speed or a change in turning. You're not either going towards or away from a stimuli. So we don't talk about it as positive or negative. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Emma. Really appreciate your wonderful presentation. I love the way that you map out the uh, topics, and that's something that I'll take away myself. Um, and there's been a few messages of thanks as well from the students. Um, really appreciate that. Um, do, we have, do we have one more? One more way. Uh, oh, sorry, that was me. <laughs> no, we're done. We're done for that's level three. That's all of them. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Emma, and uh, best of luck for your exam students. Yeah. So we can um, use these to help you and uh, earn the uh, earn the grade that you deserve. Yeah. Good luck, guys. Everyone. Kakite.